Hispanic Heritage Month, enacted into law in 1988, so the achievements of the Hispanic American people could be celebrated. Yet those who wrote the law did not foresee how its impact would become larger than imagined, that it would dovetail into what Latin Americans call Dia de la Raza, a celebration of race in the Americas. But it had not always been that way. Dia de la Raza had been the creation of a European minister by the name of Faustino Sarmiento, who sought to celebrate the accomplishments of Christopher Columbus. But as the Nobel Prize winner Gabriel Garcia Marquez has stated, history in Hispanic America is magical realism at its best. So how did we get to Hispanic Heritage Month or Dia de la Ra Raza? Well, Christopher Columbus is only part of the story. There was another man by the name of Giovanni Maria Mastai Ferretti, a man of blazing intelligence who was loved and equally hated, depending on who you asked. But mostly, he was feared. At the age of 34, his talents earned him the position of the auditor for the Viceroyalty of Peru and the Viceroyalty of Chile. He was an ambitious man, and for the rest of his life, he would try to fight that demon in order to become a more humble man. Upon his return from the Viceroyalty of Peru and the Viceroyalty of Nueva Granada, many years later, he would become Pope Pius IX, the longest serving pope in the history of the Catholic Church. Yet, that is an aside in this chronicle because the reason we are here is because in 1846, as Pope Pius IX, he signed the document that created the trial for the investigation for the potential elevation to sainthood of a man who had already been nominated twice before and had been denied both times. But the momentum within the Vatican was building to truly make the candidate a saint. So Mastai Ferretti, also known as Pope Pius IX, did what he was supposed to do. He appointed a devil's advocate, an investigative lawyer whose job was to disprove of the saintliness of the no nominated man, a process that would take the devil's advocate 18 years to complete. The man in question was Christopher Columbus. And the investigation by the devil's advocate tells us that Columbus on a warm summer's day stood out to sea in a Spanish, Spanish caravel identical to this one, as this is a modern, modern day replica of the Santa Maria. Columbus, by the age of 20, was considered to not just be a master sailor, but the greater, greatest sailor of his time. And of that, there can be no doubt. This ship may look big, but it is only 58 feet in length. For comparison, think of this. A modern Turing bus is just as big as the ship. On his voyage, Columbus did encounter a different world. And so he was made to look like a man who would be capable of doing such a feat such as in Piotr's painting of Columbus sailing by dead reckoning and moonlight. In nearly all the images one can find of Columbus at the moment of discovery, we find him dressed in the same livery, velvet robes, white furs, his attitude confident and sure, the emblems of his benefactors in his hand, the flag of Castilla and Leon waving in the wind, the distortion of history, active in this painting, as in every other painting you will, see, you will ever see of Columbus. The natives on their knees, grateful and supplicant that Columbus had saved them. In this painting by master surrealist Salvador Dali, we see Columbus single-handedly dragging the Spanish crown into the new world. And on the upper right, we see Jesus Christ on the cross that seems to be floating on air, overlooking the scene and indirectly blessing the conquest. Yet, less than a year later, in 1493, 
Columbus sailed home not on his flagship, but on a ship called La Nina, because the Taino natives living in what is present-day Haiti burned his ship and sunk it on Christmas Day, 1492. But on his voyage home, Columbus ran into what the Maya Quiche called the Unacan, the big wind that spins on one leg. The word Unacan was kept by the Spanish to become Huracan, which in English we call hurricane. Aboard La Nina, Columbus found himself between life and death as the two ships fought to survive the hurricane. The ships were scattered, and it was then that Columbus entered into a fit of real panic because he was scared, scared that no one would ever know what had become of his voyage. So Columbus put his own diary, his rudder, into a wine barrel, sealed it, and threw it overboard. So if he died, someone might find it and his name might be recorded in the annals of history. The diary, however, was never to be seen again. Today, and for the past 531 years, this document has been considered Columbus's diary. Yet, it is not. This is a book written by Frare Bartolomé de las Casas, a monk who earned the nickname the Defender of the Indians, now considered a saint by the Catholic Church. But de las Casas wrote several books, but his masterpiece is A Brief Account of the Destruction of the Indies. It is in this book that we are able to supposedly know what took place on that first voyage. Because Friar de las Casas stated, and I quote, what I write about Columbus, Columbus's document is absolutely true because the great admiral of the ocean sea let me read it and transcribe it into my own works. Yet, to believe this, it would require you to suspend belief because if Columbus, the most important man in the known world, had indeed handed over the document to Las Casas, he did so when Las Casas was only nine years old. And the document that Las Casas claims to have read has never been seen by anyone. So in 1864, 18 years after the investigation was begun and when Pope Pius IX held the report from the devil's advocate on whether to make Christopher Columbus a saint, he realized that Columbus's documents were a fiction that let slip violence, destruction, disease, and slavery upon a people and a hemisphere. And so he squashed the nomination for sainthood on Christopher Columbus and unleashed a new chapter on the history of Columbus. Yet, with that said, it is not easy to say who is bad and who is good. Because even though Columbus brought some of the worst of the wor old world into the new world, it must also be said that indirectly and unbeknownst to him, he also brought with him the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the tools that would set the Americas free. It is in this spirit that the poet Nicolas Guillén, after developing a long friendship with Langston Hughes, who was a central figure of the Harlem Renaissance, wrote a poem in 1934 titled Mis Dos Abuelos. Nicolas Guillén was a mestizo. His mother was white and his father was black, the product of, of European descent and Afro-Cuban descent. And because of his heritage, he was interested in forgiveness, acceptance, and reconciliation, the heart of what we now call Hispanic Heritage Month. I will read it, the poem first in Spanish so you hear the cadence and the tone, and then in English so you all may understand what Guillén understood so clearly, but took us nearly a century to learn. Balada de los dos abuelos, sombras que solo yo veo, me escoltan mis dos abuelos. 
lanza con punta de hueso, tambor de cuero y madera, mi abuelo negro. Gorguera en el cuello ancho, gris armadura guerrera, mi abuelo blanco. Pie desnudo, torso pétreo, los de mi negro. Pupilas de vidrio antártico, las de mi blanco. África, de selvas húmedas y de gordos gongos sordos, me muero, dice mi abuelo negro. Agua prieta de caimanes, verdes mañanas de cocos, me canso, dice mi abuelo blanco. Oh, velas de amargo viento, galeón ardiendo en oro, me muero, dice mi abuelo negro. Oh, costas de cuello virgen engañadas de avalorios, me canso, dice mi abuelo negro. Oh, puro sol repujado preso en el aro del trópico, oh, luna redonda y limpia sobre el sueño de los monos, que de barcos, que de barcos, que de negros, que de negros, que largo fulgor de cañas, que látigo el del negrero. Piedra de llanto y de sangre, venas y ojos entreabiertos y madrugadas vacías y atardeceres de ingenio. Y una gran voz, fuerte voz, despedazando el silencio. Que de barcos, que de barcos, que de negros. Sombras que solo yo veo, me escoltan mis dos abuelos. Don Perico me grita y Taita Facundo calla. Los dos en la noche sueñan y andan, andan, yo los junto. Perico, Facundo... Los dos se abrazan, los dos suspiran, los dos fuertes cabezas alzan. Los dos del mismo tamaño bajo las estrellas altas, los dos del mismo tamaño. Ansia negra y ansia blanca, los dos del mismo tamaño. Gritan, sueñan, lloran, cantan, sueñan, lloran, cantan, lloran, cantan, cantan. Ballad of my two grandfathers. Shadows that only I can see. My two grandfathers go with me. Lance with the head of bone, drum of leather and of wood, my black grandfather. Rough round his broad throat, gray warrior's armor, my white grandfather. Naked foot, body of rock, these from my black man. Pupils of untarded glass, these from my white man. Africa of dank forests and heavy muffled gongs, I am dying, says my black grandfather. Black water of crocodiles, green morning of cocoa palms. I am weary, says my white grandfather. Oh, sails of bitter wind, galleon burning gold. I am dying, says my black grandfather. Oh, coast of virgin throats, cheated with glass trinkets. I am weary, says my white grandfather. Oh, pure sun of beaten gold, caught in the hoop of the tropics. Oh, pure moon so round and clear over the sleep of monkeys. How many ships, how many ships, how many Negroes, how many Negroes? What fulgence in the sugar cane? What lashes those of the slave trader? Blood, blood, tears, tears, half open veins and eyelids and empty daybreaks and sunsets on plantations and great voice, a strong voice shattering the silence. Oh, the ships, so many ships, so many Negroes, shadows that only I can see, my two grandfathers go with me. Don Federico shouts to me and Taita Facundo is silent and both dream on through the night and I bring them together. Federico, Facundo, they both embrace, they both sigh, they both raise their proud heads under the stars. Both of the same stature, blank anguish and white anguish, both of the same stature, and they shout and dream and weep and sing and sing and sing. <laughs> <laughs>